pretty lucky these days. We have a lot of different bases to choose from. And we can kind of put the base types as far as how they do, how they form enolates into kind of two categories. Um, one category I would call kind of moderately strong bases. So something like potassium terbutoxide would fit into that bucket. Um, and how does that form an enolate with uh, something like acetone, this molecule here? Um, well, uh, again, uh, the acidic proton of acetone or some type of ketone is going to be the alpha position to the carbonyl. And if it's a ketone or aldehyde, it's going to be around 20. So we'll just say 20 is the pKa there. Um, and that moderately strong base is going to pull off that proton and form the enolate. And the conjugate acid of that base, um, this is an alcohol. Um, alcohols have pKa's usually of about 16. It turns out the pKa of terbutanol, 16 would have been fine if, if that's what, it's kind of the same result. Uh, terbutanol actually has a pKa of 18. Um, so, so is this going to be favored in this direction? No, this is the stronger acid, so there's going to be more of this stuff over here, um, but both sides of this equilibrium will be re represented. Um, and I think I said this before, but essentially how, how equilibrium, equilibria work is that, um, especially with acid-base stuff, is that both sides exist. So there's some amount of material here, some amount of material over here. If the pKa difference is somewhere between five to seven units. Um, so it can be pretty substantially different. Seven units is a pretty substantial amount, um, but still have some amount of the material over here. And if this is the reactive species on this side, and even if, even if it's only 1%, that 1% is going to react. And just like Le Chatelier, like we've talked about a, a bunch of times, if this reacts, then the equilibrium is going to be forced forward, and a little bit, a little bit, a little bit will react until all of it's reacted. Um, so we can form enolates with these moderately strong bases where just a little bit's being formed, and that will still allow us to um, use them as nucleophiles. And these moderately strong bases, uh, sometimes we have a ketone that is non-symmetrical. Um, so this is a symmetrical ketone, but something like this is a little bit different, right? There's a CH3 group right here, so we have one H on this side and two H's on this side. And any time that we're, we're working through an equilibrium and it's able to go forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward, um, the equilibrium is going to settle into the most stable position. So something that we're, we're going to talk about right now is, is thermodynamic versus kinetic enolates. Um, kinetic enolates are the ones that form fastest. So kinetic, they form fastest. Uh, but we also have thermodynamic kinolates. Thermodynamic. And we've seen this thermodynamic versus kinetic uh, paradigm a few times in organic chemistry at this point. Uh, kinetics forming the fastest and the thermodynamic is the most stable. The most stable. Um, so if we think about what side will be the protonated fastest, what do we think? All right, so think through a reason for yourself. Write something down. Okay, you did that. So the faster deprotonation is going to be the one that the base is able to get to easier, right? Um, and which side is going to be easier to get to? Uh, well, this side has a big CH3 surrounding that H and then these other carbons. So essentially there's a lot of stuff crowding that side, whereas these two H's are kind of just more accessible. So this is going to be able to deprotonate these more sterically accessible hydrogens at a faster rate. So this would be the, the faster side. Um, so uh, if we were to make that enolate, it would look something like this. And again, why is that so stable? It's because the negative charge isn't just there, but it's also on the oxygen. Um, if we deprotonated the other side, we would form negative charge there, 
that is also delocalized onto that oxygen. So, um, so that would be what that enolate looks like. Uh, we already kind of talked about this would be the faster deprepanation, so we know that this is the kinetic enolate. So um, at this point, why would this one be the thermodynamic? Uh, we, we talked previously when we were doing 1-2 versus 1-4 addition that sometimes the 1-2 product is both the kinetic and the thermodynamic enolate. Um, so which, which enolate, that one or that one, would you expect as the thermodynamic enolate? And give yourself a reason why. Okay, um, so uh, hopefully you said this is the thermodynamic enolate, and the reason why is because it's a more substituted alkene. This is a tri-substituted alkene. This is a di-substituted alkene. Um, so this is the thermodynamic enolate. And what did we say? I said it a moment ago about these moderately strong bases. Because the equilibrium is able to shift back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, over and over and over again, it is going to settle into the thing that is most stable. The most stable thing is that thermodynamic enolate. So these moderately strong bases, while they might have deprotonated the easier position first, at some point it is going to go into the more favorable thermodynamic well of the more stable species. So moderately strong bases form more of the thermodynamic enolate. Okay, um, what else can we form there? Hmm. So we have our moderately strong bases that form the enolates. Um, and it turns out these days, lots of bases to choose from. We also could use an extremely strong base and that's going to make the enolate unidirectionally. So no equilibrium here, just forward movement to that enolate. Um, so what's the strongest base that we've worked with? Okay, so some of you are saying organolithiates. That is an extremely strong base. Um, what did we do this with? Uh, we used sodium NH2 to do that. Um, so we could have also done this with an organolithiate. Say we used butyl lithium. That will deprotonate that hydrogen. Um, but what we used here was more sodium NH2. Um, so what, what should we use here? Well, if we use butyl lithium to deprotonate, this position here, is that going to work? Um, well, we learned that these organometallic reagents, um, Grignard's organolithiates, they add directly to the carbonyl carbon in uh, if we were to mix an organolithiate or a Grignard with a carbonyl. So we're not going to be able to use that. Um, what about if we used sodium and H2? And I'm actually going to draw it, I'm going to write it over here. Sodium NH2. Um, is this going to deprotonate that? If it did it, it would make NH3. So let's first kind of analyze, is this going to do this unidirectionally? Are we going to make just that product? So uh, we're going to analyze the pKa's here. The pKa of this ketone is 20. The pKa of ammonia is 38. Um, so this is the stronger acid. It's going to push it that way. Is it five to seven, it's, is it smaller than seven units difference? No, it's an 18 unit difference. So this is a substantial difference enough to where it would push it all the way forward. Um, however, turns out we actually can't use sodium NH2. Why do you think that might be? Yeah, it's the same reason why we can't use a Grignard or an organolithium. If we mix these two together, we're not going to form this. This NH2 is going to add to the carbonyl carbon, and instead we would be forming the imine. Um, so uh, so that, that's not what we want to do here. Um, so we need a really strong base like this, and I, I, I have that on the bullet point below. We need a really strong base, but we need, we need an extreme extremely strong non-nucleophilic base. Um, so how do we make a base non-nucleophilic? Um, so what, what did we do when we wanted to force 
a reaction to do an elimination instead of a substitution. So if we wanted, if we had an alkyl halide and it was going to give us just SN2 or a mixture of SN2 and E2, um, but we only wanted E2 to occur. Yeah, what we did is we used something like potassium terbutoxide that was really bulky. And the more bulky a reagent is, the less nucleophilic it, it becomes. Essentially, it has a harder time getting to that antibonding orbital that we've talked about when it has a lot of steric bulk on it. Um, but we know that potassium terbutoxide isn't a strong enough base to, um, to unidirectionally quantitatively deprotonate and make these enolates. So uh, what could we do to the strong base right here uh, to make it non-nucleophilic? Yeah, we made oxygen bulky by adding big bulky groups. Um, we would want to do the same thing with this nitrogen. Um, and in this case, the, the most common reagent that is used is, is not putting terbutyl groups on the nitrogen, we actually put isopropyl groups on the nitrogen. Um, and it's actually something called LDA, lithium diisopropyl amine, lithium diisopropyl amine. So essentially it's an N, a nitrogen, with two isopropyl groups that make it big and bulky. It's got two lone pairs, a negative charge, and L stands for lithium, so it has lithium and counter ion. Um, so this is an extremely strong non-nucleophilic base. So it's got the same basic strength as this. It would have a similar pKa as a conjugate acid, but it's not able to add to the carbonyl carbon because it's too bulky. So if we want to form an enolate quantitatively, unidirectionally, um, we would not want to use LDA to do that. Um, what about the same question we had above? What if we had a ketone that is asymmetric. Um, so we have essentially this hydrogen that can be deprotonated or these two. Um, well, if we use a super strong and extremely strong base, um, it turns out that they make, so we'll put the LDA here, super strong bases when we treat them, when, when we add a super strong base to a, uh, a ketone is going to, it's not going to wait around. It's not going to go back and forth as this equilibrium. It's going to react as fast as it can. It's going to go through the lowest activation energy pathway possible. And just like we talked about earlier, the more accessible hydrogens are going to be the fastest things that we can react with. So LDA is going to selectively form the more or the, the, the less substituted uh, enolate, so this is the kinetic enolate, and that is what these extremely strong non-nucleophilic non bases do. They go for the more accessible position. Um, so that's the last blank on your course packet. Stronger non-nucleophilic bases form more of the kinetic enolate. So the, the blank was kinetic. Um, so if we want to form the, the thermodynamic enolate, we go with kind of a moderately strong base, such as potassium terbutoxide. If we want to form the kinetic enolate, we're going to use the extremely strong base, such as lithium disperbalamine. All right.